right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I'll send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and it's been a year since Nikon released their flagship Z9 into the world. The Z9 for Nikon kind of felt like this could be the start of a new future, a new direction, or it could all come crashing down. That's why I was surprised when prior to the announcement, I got a call from the vice president of Nikon USA saying, we want to bring you the Z9 to test out. My first reply was, are you sure? Because I'm going to say it like it is. And their reply was, we think you're going to like it. Fast forward a year, a few firmware updates, new lenses, and 26,000 photos across portrait shoots, concerts, animals, professional soccer, and even Major League Baseball. And the big question is, how does it hold up a year later? Now, before I jump into a recap of the specs, I wanna share with everyone that I started shooting Nikon at 15 years old and continued to do so up until roughly three years ago. Now, in fact, if Nikon released the Z9 within a year of releasing the Z6 and Z7, there's a pretty good chance I would have stayed, but they didn't. And they were the last of the big three to put out a flagship camera. And yes, I consider the R3 from Canon to be a flagship camera. Anyway, let's recap the major specs of this camera. The Z9 sports a 45.7 megapixel stacked CMOS sensor that's capable of shooting up to 20 frames per second raw for over 1,000 images in a burst. That's 50 seconds, by the way. You can also shoot 30 frames per second, but only in full res JPEG, and even 120 frames per second in JPEG small. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, the camera doesn't have a shutter. So every photo you take is with the electronic shutter. The Z9 has the latest Nikon processor in the way of the Xpeed 7, which helps process the 493 autofocusing points with AI-based subject detection. Now I know that sounds good, but is it really? We'll get to that later on as well. The native ISO range is 64 to 25,600. In terms of video capabilities, you can shoot up to 8.3K in 60P and RAW. Now we'll get more into video a little later on in this video. Now moving on to the body, you've got a beefy feeling, heavy pro body that sports a built-in grip with a large long lasting battery, a 3.69 million dot real live view OLED display that's big and bright and gives you blackout free shooting. There's a four axis tilting touchscreen, weather sealing, back illuminated buttons, IBIS, inputs galore, sensor shield, and dual CF Express type B memory cards. If there's ever been a body worthy of the term pro, the Z9 is it. It's bigger and heavier than what Canon and Sony offer, but I think Nikon wasn't too concerned about size and weight. On the lens front, Nikon has a nice current lineup of Z glass, though they could use a little more. The good news is this, Nikon priced the Z9 $500 less than Canon's R3 and $1,000 less than Sony's A1. The Z9 clocks in at $5,500 in the US and $73,924.12 in Canada. Uh, you, buddy. Nikon certainly didn't take a minimalist approach when they created this body. So how does it hold up a year later? Well, it's, it's hanging in there, it's chugging along slowly, and I think that it's pulling up the rear behind Sony and Canon. It got some welcome updates and fixes with the release of firmware 2.0, but firmware 3.0 should not have been called 3.0, maybe 2.5 at the most, as it added a few new video and photo features. But 3.0 certainly didn't move the needle very much for still shooters. The thing about the Z9 being the last of the flagships out is that many Nikon shooters already jump ship and the majority of people looking for a flagship camera at this point will not be looking in Nikon's direction. Now I said in my initial preview a year ago, if you're a Nikon pro and you haven't jumped ship just yet, 
This is the best mirrorless camera that Nikon's ever released. One of the biggest deviations away from a normal camera was Nikon's choice to do away completely with a shutter. At first, I had concerns about banding or other issues that might arise from not having an actual shutter for those times where it's just in case. But looking back at all the shots that I've done with stack sensor cameras, from the A9 to the A1 to the R3 and now the Z9, I haven't run into any situations where I thought that the mechanical shutter was needed. In fact, I shot a concert at a venue with the worst flickering LED lights ever, and I was able to come away with some great shots. So it seems that Nikon's decision to do away with a mechanical shutter was the right one, and I still expect other manufacturers to follow suit in the future. One of the first things I noticed when turning the Z9 on is how fast it starts up. It's instant on and instant off. Canon's R3 takes a split second to go on, and the Sony A1, well, that takes what seems to be an eternity to fire up as well as shut down. Along with instant on, instant off, and the lack of a shutter, Nikon added something called sensor shield. The shield goes away when you turn the camera on and comes down instantly to cover the sensor as soon as the camera goes off. This is great to fight dust or debris from getting on the sensor when you're changing lenses. Now, other companies allow you to drop the shutter when the camera goes off to give you some protection, but it's not instant. Nikon got this feature super right. Since we're talking about body features, let's keep going in that direction. It's a big, beefy body that feels heavy and bottom-weighted in your hands. It's almost like Nikon did absolutely nothing to bring the weight down whatsoever. Without a battery, it weighs 2.6 pounds or 1160 grams, whereas the Canon R3 without a battery weighs in at 1.8 pounds or 822 grams, almost a full pound less. Now, regardless of weight, the Z9 feels like an absolute tank in the hands. It's big, sturdy, but not as ergonomically sound in my hands as I would like. Even though there's a ton of buttons, some feel like they are misplaced and a little awkward to get to when you need them. Now, some of that might vary based on the size of your hands, but I can tell you the Canon R3 feels better and more thought out in my hands personally. One thing Nikon got really right is the EVF. It's big, bright, and beautiful. The LCD touch panel Nikon uses once again is the best out of the flagship cameras that I've used. Now, some people might be upset that the screen doesn't flip out and rotate, and I guess at this point, I'm apt to agree with them in some ways. The screen doesn't flip all the way down for those photographers who need to hold the camera above their head. It only flips out so far. A year ago, the design seemed pretty forward thinking, but today it seems like it's already dated. Is it a deal breaker? No, not at all, but it's something that they could improve in future iterations. Another thing that could be improved on is the memory card slot door. It's not that easy to quickly open. Now for me, someone who doesn't need to swap cards out during a shoot, it's not a big deal. But for sports shooters who constantly need to hand cards to runners, it slows them down. Again, not a deal breaker, but something I've heard a bunch of Z9 shooters complain to me about. On the flip side, the good news is, Nikon made the right choice by going with CF Express Type B cards. They're extremely fast, sizable, and affordable compared to other mediums. And the last body feature I wanna mention is the back illuminated buttons. Now I know this sounds small, but this is a great feature that Nikon has included in their pro bodies that other manufacturers haven't caught up with yet. If I had to rank the three flagship bodies and we're talking about just the bodies right here, I would say the Canon's R3 takes first place for me, with the Z9 coming in second just ahead of the Sony A1, which is in third. Now there's a bunch of reasons I would put the Z9's body ahead of the A1's, but it's mostly comes down to the fact that the grip is built in and just feels better in the hands. Now I know some people who have the Sony A1 love the fact that they can take the grip off and put it back on when they need it because they can make it smaller, but even when you put the grip on there, it just doesn't have that pro feel. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the 120 to 300 2.8 and edited with Fropac 3 starting with Zoolander. Then we have Prestige Worldwide. Then we've got November Rain, followed by Mount Airy, as well as Mentos. 
We got King Contrast, which looks great, followed by Eckert, Canadian Tuxedo, and Fifth Element. But my all-time favorite with this photo is Skittles from Fro Pack One. With one click, bam, that thing looks absolutely incredible. So look, if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point either on the computer in Lightroom or in Lightroom Mobile, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters, and if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to get Skittles, you can get the Fropack Triple Play Bundle, which includes Fropack 1, 2, and 3, and you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now let's shift gears to the 45.7 megapixel stacked sensor. It's hands down a fantastic sensor. I've always loved Nikon's image quality and raw files. The colors, the tones, and clarity have always been some of the best in the industry, and the black and whites have always been amazing. The Z9 sensor does not disappoint. It has plenty of pixels to work with, whether you're someone who is looking to crop or print some massive prints. Though to be fair, you can print some massive prints from a 6.2 megapixel D1X that was from way back in the day. With the Z9, you've got shooting speed, but with a compromise. You can shoot stills at 20 frames per second in compressed RAW. In fact, you can't shoot uncompressed RAW at all. You can shoot stills at 30 frames per second, but only in JPEG. You can even shoot stills at 120 frames per second, but in JPEG small, which yields an 11 megapixel file. Now, firmware 3.0 brought the ability to shoot 60 still frames per second, still in a JPEG only, but now with a DX crop. On the flip side, Sony's 50 megapixel A1 can shoot RAW images at 30 frames per second in compressed RAW and 20 frames per second in uncompressed RAW. Canon's R3, which has half the megapixels, lets you shoot 30 frames per second uncompressed RAW, and with the recent firmware update, you can shoot the equivalent of 150 frames per second in full RAW. The only caveat there is focus is locked on the first frame, but you're still getting 50 full res RAW files in a quarter of a second. Now, I'm not sure where the limitations lie with the Z9 that doesn't allow it at the very least to shoot RAW files at 30 frames per second. Is it the Xpeed 7 processor or is it something else? Now, I know a whole bunch of people out there are screaming at their screens right now saying, but Jared, sports shooters don't shoot RAW, so 30 frames per second JPEG is perfectly fine. One, I'm not gonna get into the debate about RAW versus JPEG for sports. It's your body, your choice. I just so happen to choose to shoot raw regardless of what I shoot. I shoot raw, I and two, if Sony can crank out 30 frames per second raw at 50 megapixels, why can't Nikon? Look, the Z9 is a fast and extremely capable camera. Not everyone needs 20 frames per second or more. I totally get that. But when the competition's flagships goes to 11, these go to 11, and you only go to nine, not even 10? Oh, 11, and most of 11, the and then amps go up to 10. Exactly. It has to be discussed. I do want to mention that firmware 2.0 added some features around pre and post shooting of images. Now here's how that works. When this feature is turned on in the menu and you press the shutter button halfway down in 30 and 120 frames per second stills mode, the camera starts buffering images. When you finally press the button down, up to one full second of images are captured before your actual burst, and something like a half a second after you stop shooting. This is a killer feature and how I ended up with the impossible shot. It makes capturing lightning much easier as you simply press the button as soon as you see lightning and bam, you captured lightning in a camera and not in a bottle. If I could save time in a bottle. This is the future of photography. In fact, Canon just introduced a similar mode into their $2,500 R6 Mark II that's not a stack sensor, by the way, that allows you to pre-capture raw images and after the fact, scroll through a timeline to pluck out the perfect raw image right on the back of the camera. Will this be something Nikon is able to include in lesser expensive cameras in the future? And maybe with raw capture capabilities? 
I guess time will tell. How's the lens selection for the Z9? Well, Nikon's done a nice job of giving Nikon shooters the expected pro glass. You have the 14 to 24, the 24 to 70, the 70 to 200 2.8, the 105 macro, a 51.2, 400 2.8 TC, 600 F4 TC, as well as some mega zooms and a whole collection of 1.8 glass. You pretty much have everything you need to fill up your camera bag. And if you don't have everything, you can always break out the F to Z adapter and slap on your F mount lenses. In my experience, adapting high-end pro glass to the Z9 in the way of the 400 2.8 AFS and even the 120 to 300 2.8, they handled extremely well. Now, when I adapted the 105 1.4, on the other hand, it was pretty hit or miss with accuracy. And in the past, when adapting a lens like the 35 1.4 to the Z6 II and the Z6 or the Z7 and the Z7 II, I felt that it lacked the edge-to-edge -edge sharpness that I'd come to know when using Nikon DSLRs. But I do want to give major props to Nikon for being able to stack their lineup with both high-end Pro Z glass as well as more affordable Pro options. Now, it would be nice to see them come out with some other types of Z lenses like 105 1.4 and 85 1.2, which is already on their roadmap, as well as a 35 1.2 and maybe more. Now, before I quickly hit on the video specs of the Z9, my primary focus of this one year later review is the camera as it pertains to stills. Nonetheless, Nikon did spend a lot of marketing juice on hyping the Z9 and its video features. It features the ability to record internally up to 8.3K at 60P. You also have 4.1K up to 120P and many more options. In fact, you can get up to two hours of record time when shooting 10-bit 8K UHD without overheating. Now, it does capture some fantastic looking cinematic footage, but so do other cameras from Canon and Sony for a few grand less. Now, if you're looking for a full review of the Z9's video features, I highly recommend you check out Gerald Undone's video over on his YouTube channel. And now for what you've all been waiting for, the autofocus. The autofocus in the Z9 is the best autofocus Nikon's ever had in a camera, but it falls well short of its competitors. Look, I get it. I see the comments. I see people constantly saying cameras are more than just autofocus. Sure, that's true, except for the people that rely on autofocus for the work they do. This has been another excuse people who have never used a modern Canon or Sony mirrorless camera continually use to defend a camera they've either never tried or do not own. I've used every camera that Nikon, Canon, and Sony has released over the last decade. I understand the nuances and differences between the systems. I also know how to properly set up the cameras to give me the best chance of nailing the focus time and time again. So when people tell me I'm not setting the Z9 properly and that's why it's not doing this or doing that, I assure you it's not me, it's the camera. I know this because I can turn on any Canon or Sony, even the $879 R10 and the focus instantly does what it's supposed to do. Now that that's out of the way, the Z9's autofocus, as I said, is the best autofocusing Nikon camera ever made. The Z6 and Z6 II and the Z7 and the Z7II's autofocus was a struggle. I could have a subject in front of me and the focus could not find them to save its life. And no matter how many firmware updates were put out, they couldn't make up for a shortfall in hardware horsepower. The Z9, on the other hand, from pre-production firmware to now 3.0, kind of works fine, but is super quirky. Now, I've talked with plenty of other professional sports shooters who use the Z9 who echo the same sentiment that I have, that it's a struggle. Sometimes it's spot on, and other times it just loses its focus, pun absolutely intended. It's like you're fighting with the autofocus and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But these same photographers have also told me that they've gotten images that they otherwise would have missed with their old Nikon DSLRs. And that's something that I've been saying since day one of using IAF and lock-on tracking, first with a Sony, then with a Canon, and now with the Z9. The Z9's autofocus is light years ahead of all other Z cameras. 
And if you've never used Canon's or Sony's AF, the Z9s will flat out blow your mind. Even in its hobbled state, it's still mind blowing what it's capable of capturing. The thought that continues to pop into my mind is this. You shouldn't have to spend $5,500 to get competent autofocus. And it has to be only a matter of time before Nikon is able to put the Z9's AF into much less expensive bodies. Honestly, they have to. They have to have more affordable options where the AF just works. Just think of Canon. They've got the R10, the R7, the R6, the R5, and of course the R3. I know the Nikon shooters who have stuck it out are upset that I harp so much on this one thing. But the people that jumped ship years ago to Canon or Sony, they know exactly what I'm talking about and fully get it. And guess what I want? I want all you Nikon diehards to know what it's like to have a camera's autofocus that just works. In closing, the Nikon Z9 is a fantastic camera. It's the best digital flagship Nikon's ever made. It's not perfect, but it's also not that far off. If you're a diehard professional Nikon shooter with a D5 or D6, and you're not gonna jump ship to Canon or Sony, it's time. It's time you take the plunge and dive headfirst into the mirrorless world and experience what you've been missing out on. But if spending $5,500 to get autofocus that kinda works isn't your thing, maybe it's time to jump ship and look somewhere else. Jared Poland, Photo. Dot com. See ya.